Okay, so we do have a sizable number of people who have joined. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, congratulations to all the, the newly admitted Tritons. Uh, welcome to UCSD. Uh, very excited for, for the fall quarter to begin. And I've already had a chance to uh, interact with a lot of you. And if we haven't met already, we will meet in person soon, uh, I hope. Uh, my name is Sai. I'm a graduate student in the Biological Sciences program. Um, I, I'm, I'm specializing in neuroscience. And uh, I also serve as the graduate programs intern here at ISPO. And yeah, I'm excited to be hosting this session. And the idea for this session is uh, we're just going to be, it's called Unlocking Research Opportunities at UC San Diego. And we are mostly going to uh, focus on the general broad strokes of it because uh, our attendees uh, come from different programs on campus and every program and every degree does it a different way. So we're just going to give you some general guidelines and uh, there's also a Q&A feature. So before we begin, uh, I'm going to get us started with some housekeeping items. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, you are only on listen only mode, uh, so which means you can hear us, but we cannot hear you. Uh, next, we are recording, and the webinar will be posted at inewstudentswebinars.ucsd.edu. And lastly, please remember to use the Q&A box to get your questions answered. And even if you aren't able to answer them today uh, through our chat or during the Q&A session at the end, uh, there are a variety of ways to get connected with ISPO and to get those questions answered. And you're also welcome to um, submit your questions at icontact.ucsd.edu and we can uh, get you connected with uh, people and experts who might have the answers. So yeah, so let's just begin without further ado. The session today is called Unlocking Research Opportunities at UC San Diego. This is a, a session for graduate students. Um, next slide, please. So, um, we the idea for today's uh, the structure is we have some uh, representatives from uh, campus organizations, the the library and the teaching and learning commons, who uh, will walk you through uh, the resources that we have on campus, and then we have a panel uh, comprised of staff and graduate students here at UC San Diego, where uh, they can talk about their experiences. We have some questions coming up, and if you have any questions from them, please, uh, as we go, uh, please put them in the uh, in the Q and A section, and we'll have them answered. So let's begin. I think uh, yes. So let's just start with presenter introductions. Uh, Tim, if you would go ahead and get us started, please. Hi, I'm Tim. I am the first year experience librarian here at UC San Diego. Uh, Sarah, you want to go? Yeah, I can go ahead. Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Seja. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the graduate writing Twitter coordinator uh, with the Writing Hub over at the Teaching and Learning Commons. So I'm here to talk about the library, and these are going to be the same slides that I had this morning. Um, but I'm going to go over more in depth kind of those high touch opportunities, the opportunities where we really can work with you one on one uh, looking at your research projects and, and how we can assist with that. So uh, in general, the, the library website is our place to go for all this information. Um, the big search box in the middle is UC Library Search that searches all of the books here on this campus and some uh, journals, so journal articles. Uh, it's a good resource to start off with, but you all are, are all uh, graduate students or, or doing research, so you should all probably have uh, go more in depth that, than the articles listed just in UC Library Search. Uh, finding books on this campus, we use Library of Congress classification system that involves letters and numbers. Just be aware of that, that finding books can be a little bit um, of a process here. Uh, if you don't want to go and pursue and uh, per use of stacks, you can have items requested to be pulled from there and, and put on the hold shelf. That's going to take a few days, though, for that to happen. So just be aware of that. Um, but what we really want to talk about is the subject and course guides and, and the ways to get help. So uh, we've broken up the library into smaller pieces. Um, so we, we have databases on every area taught on campus. Uh, and you should be probably using as graduate students those those subject specific resources as opposed to kind of the general resources. Uh, they're going to be easier to to 
they're going to be easier to, to work with in your subject area. They're going to be more specific. They're going to provide you better results. Um, so that's where that subject and course guide link comes in. We have one for every area taught on campus. Uh, that's the, the place that I would go. Um, the other area that we wanted to, to point out on this slide is um, the Ask Us for Help, uh, ucsd.libanswers.com. There we belong to a 24-7 chat service. So if you need help um, with research and, and finding materials and having access to materials um, and at any time of the day, you can use that. You're not going to get somebody from UC San Diego at 2 a.m. on a Sunday, but you'll get somebody. Uh, and then we'll follow up with you on the next business day. So that is a good resource for you to use. We also on that link, uh, we'll have a we'll have um, we'll have a page for making an appointment with a librarian. We have a subject specialist for every area taught in this library. They're the ones who buy in this area. So earlier this morning, we had a, a purchase request form, a purchase request. Uh, you can go straight to your subject specialist for that. Our librarians really like to work with grad students and the kind of in-depth work. So um, if you're having a hard time, we have general help uh, in Geisel Library, uh, drop-in help from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Thursday, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. on Friday. We have that 24-7 chat for general help. But if you're really looking for in-depth assistance and you're having a hard time uh, getting started with that literature review, uh, that's where you might want to contact a subject specialist and do an appointment. Uh, they're going to be mostly held through Zoom, but if you email them, uh, they, they might be able to meet with you in person too. Um, so yeah, the subject specialists are going to be huge help there. And then the other thing is the VPN. Uh, like I mentioned this morning, the VPN is going to be very important to you. If you're on campus, you need to be on a protected network that includes graduate housing. The protected networks um, are how you get access to library resources. If you are off campus, if you're at Starbucks, at Phil's Coffee, wherever you are, um, you need to use the VPN to access library materials. That's a small piece of software you download, um, and then you launch that each time. You're going to need you're going to get the Duo notification, and everyone hates to do a notification, but that's fine. Um, all right, next slide. And then here are the kind of more specific resources for for um, research in particular. We really want to highlight our research data and curation program. Those are the people who can help you uh, manage your data. If you're, it's like part of your, your agreement or your grant or whatever that you need to make your data available, you need to store it properly, whatever, um, that research data creation program can really be helpful there. They can help you with all stages of data. And then we also have the data and GIS lab, not to be confused, they both have data in their name, but the data and GIS lab relates to uh, plotting data. It relates to managing data sets, finding data sets, uh, GIS work in terms of, of, yeah, any maps or GIS uh, topics you might be looking at. Um, so that's all available too if you have data that you need to visualize in some sort of way. And then the last one that we want to highlight is uh, the scholarly communication support. So um, that is our, our team that works with scholarly communications, obviously. Uh, they, they handle our instance of e-scholarship, which is the University of California open access platform. Uh, so when you're at that point and you, you're ready to, to publish, uh, you can work with them on getting things into e-scholarship uh, if that's part of your agreement. They also have agreements, we, the library and, and the University of California have agreements with a, a variety of publishers on waiving some article publication charges or lessening some artic article publication charges um, in particular. So depending upon where you submit your research, depending upon what journal you submit, um, there could be ways to lowering some of those costs. Uh, the library is a big proponent of open access. We believe that that yeah, we should we should try and do open access as much as possible. So um, if you can work that into your agreement, that would be great. Do I have any questions? If you have any questions, feel free to put them into chat and I can answer them there. If not, Sarah, would you like to go? Yep, thank you, Tim. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit more about the Writing Hub over at the Teaching and Learning Commons and the services that we provide. Um, just as a part of the research process, it is 
nine times out of 10 are going to be that you have writing at some point in that process. And if you need any further assistance or support with that, then the writing hub is your place to go. So we're able to offer um, support on the individual level, as well as provide some community spaces for um, writers with larger projects. So one of the main things that we do as far as individual help would be one-on-one -on -one consultations. Um, and at these, you would be working with a fellow graduate student who has been trained to provide um, support and feedback and help with revisions on any kind of writing that you might want to bring to the table. And so this could be your dissertation. Um, if you're hoping to publish and you want to bring something in just to get a second pair of eyes on it, I know that can be very useful. Um, you're able to do that as well. Um, if you're looking for kind of more community options in order to build um, that sense of accountability with others, you're looking for a group of folks who are also working on um, big research projects, and you're able to bring that um, to different sources like our daily writing room, this is a little bit lower stakes, just two hours reserved weekday mornings um, to have some of that structured time with a grad writing consultant to set goals, check in, um, and be sure that you're being productive and making a full use of that time. Um, we also have grad writing workshops that are catered to specific themes that might be useful. So in the fall, for instance, and I can send the link to this uh, a link to this events page in just a sec, but we'll have, for instance, a workshop on how to manage a large writing project. So as part of your research, if you're hoping to, for instance, publish or um, there's some other long-term project that you need to plan for, but you're not really sure where to start. That workshop would be the perfect place for you to come in. You can meet other folks who are in the same boat and also hear from an experienced grad consultant on how you can approach this type of project. Um, another thing that we offer is graduate writing retreats. Um, again, I'll send the link in just a second, but we have these are larger um, chunks of time, kind of three to four hours, depending on the day. Some are available evening, uh, weekend hours to really accommodate the schedules that y'all might have. Um, and this is, again, that structured time and space that you have this consultant who can kind of help you through any bumps in the road um, in your process. If you need to chat with someone really quickly to just kind of get over this writer's block, you're able to do that, but you also have this set time to meet um, your own goals as far as your projects go. Um, this fall, we're really lucky and, and very excited to offer in archival retreat with special collections, um, where if you sign up, that'll, that one will be in person. Um, you can sign up, request the unique collections that you'd like to browse at that time, um, but you'll be in community with other folks who are at that same stage in their process, right? Using this for their research and trying to get a sense of how to make sense of all of this material, right? So you'll be working with a consultant on that. Um, but again, this is one of those things where we have uh, kind of built in community to kind of help. Um, we know that a lot of the grads at times work best in community and it can get a little lonely right when you're very invested in your own research. So we have these um, dedicated sources of support to kind of help through that. Um, so we we help writers. Again, we're building that support system, cultivating agency, right? You have the choice and how you want to spend your own time. You set the goals and we just kind of help you along the way there and as best we can. Um, there are a couple of links here and you can scan this QR code to see more about um to see more about the services that we offer and i'll send a link to the events uh, sign up page in just a sec as well so again learning to write um, is learning to participate in your given research community and we know that that looks very different across disciplines across programs um, and so in these events, whether it be a workshop, retreat, or an individual consultation, you'll notice that our consultants are very aware of that, and they recognize that it's not so much a question of your talent as a researcher or writer per se, but it's about this continuous process of immersion and practice and mistakes and learning from those. So it's a slow um, an evolving understanding of how to speak to and be within your unique disciplines. Um, we also have, for instance, our consultant bios up on our website. And so if you're looking for someone who has more of the unique set of knowledges that comes with being in a particular discipline, you are more than welcome to book an appointment with someone who you think will have that um, that specific background that you're looking for to give you a little bit more tailored advice. Um, but above all, we just want to 
let it be known that you have agency in this participation, right? So as far as the writing hub fitting into this process, we can go to the next slide. Um, these are, again, some of the things that I mentioned, right? So the writing consultations, here you have a link to the platform that we use to schedule those. Uh, again, any stage of the writing process, any program, it could be half an hour to an hour session. Um, and you just need to make an account on my wconline.com. So you can visit that and you'll be able to access the full schedule. Um, again, a little bit more on the daily writing room, retreats and workshops. Another really uh, fun thing that we're able to offer this coming fall quarter is the virtual writing room, bringing it to a hybrid setting, at least for Wednesdays throughout the quarter. Um, if you are interested, you're able to be in person at Special Collections in Geisel Library from 9 to 11 a.m. Um, again, to find this dedicated time to write. Um, yeah, so I'll send a couple of links to the signups page in just a sec. But again, it's any level, um, any graduate level writing. So this could include, you know, not only your dissertation, but if you're hoping to publish research grant application materials, our consultants are more than familiar with that as grads themselves. A lot of them have applied for these things too. Um, and so in that sense, they have not only the experience, but also the training to be able to offer quality feedback. Um, so that's just a little bit more about the writing hub. I'll go ahead and send the link to the events page in just a sec. And we're happy to take any questions that might come up as well. Thank you so much, Tim and Sarah. That was really helpful. And before we transition uh, to the panel, uh, we do have a special feature, uh, Grad Slam, uh, which is an annual competition uh, that's held uh, University of California system wide. It's basically you present your research by transcending the barriers of jargon in an accessible manner. Um, I was uh, a participant, a finalist this year, and it was a great experience. So I thought uh, this would be a great place for people to talk about their research journey. And also these are all recorded and I can put the link in the chat. Uh, so then you can also look up uh, people talking about their research condensed to a general broader audience. Um, and so today we have uh, Sean, who was actually a campus finalist uh, this year who represented UCSD um, at the UC system-wide uh, grad slam. So we have Sean here who's going to share his experience a little bit and give us a glimpse into his research. Sean, take it away. Hi guys, um, can you guys hear me well? Yes, cool. All right, so great to be here. Thank you, Sai, for inviting me. Um, as I mentioned uh, last year, uh, we were we were all the finalists for the Grass Slam competition, and it was great experience. And I would say that it's a really good experience for people who want to engage in like a way to share your research to um a larger population. So what Grass Slam what Grass Slam does is basically you go on stage, you want to condense your stuff like you did a 20, 20 page research paper, but you want to condense that into a three minute talk. And it's it's hard in its own way, but it has its appeal as it. It, it allows people to access your information easily and people can really get to know what you're doing. So I feel like it's a really great opportunity. And so this slide you guys see here up in the um, this PPT, uh, this PowerPoint slide, is basically the topic I had for my Grassland competition. And so I talked about a research I did about soliloquizing, which is talking to yourself. And with that technique, we find out ways for that to be a way um, for a non-native non English speaker to learn how to improve their English language speaking skills. So I talked about something that I did in the past, and it was something that I feel like could, um, could address a wider population because I feel like some people are learning different languages and they could all find ways to improve their speaking fluency. So I would say um, if you guys want to join Grasslam, feel free to talk about something that you've been doing and talk about something that you feel like could um, be applied to settings where um, all people could benefit benefit from or interesting to learn from. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Yes, thank you. So as you guys know, grass limb is only three minutes. So basically what I what we all had was only one slide. So this happened to all of us, all grassland finalists. We only had one slide to talk about everything. It was it was pretty uh, it was pretty stressful, but it was very, very uh, challenging and fun. Um, I remember during the, we had these, um, the finalists, we had these brainstorming workshops where all of the finalists came together and we gave each other feedback. 
And I remember um, last year, I my slide doesn't look like this. This is the slide you guys see right here, the 12 minute slide. That is actually a refined version. And the original slide I had was a lot of stats and stuff on there. I got my research procedure up on there. And then while well, all my finalist friends are for side, they give us some so great um, information of how to make your slides better and eventually turn out to be something like this. So I would say the Grassland experience for me was not only a way to express my own research, but it's also a way to form your own community and find friends that also are also interested in sharing research ideas. And you got you get to be elevated, you get to be um, you got to be refined in your content, and people will talk about how to make your research even better. And so this is a picture of me in the UCSD Grad Slam, and um, I was uh, I was quite lucky. I won the uh, uh, the UCSD um, championship. So I then went on to yes, thank you, great timing. Yes. Uh, so I went on to do a uh, University of California Grass Slam, which was a Grass Slam for all 10 University of California campuses. It was so fun. Um, the school flew me out to San Francisco and I had like a I got a hotel and it was so fun. Um, uh, I got to meet a lot of people, all these other UC school competitors. They were very, very um, very, very smart and had really interesting research topics. People talk about COVID research talked about um, bird songs in Hawaii. So, you know, like the sky is the limit. You'll be able to talk about whatever you're interested in, you're passionate about, and you'll be having a broad audience and sitting there and focusing on you, listening to what you have to say. So um, if we can go to the next slide, I think to kind of sum this up, you can see that all of us, we're, 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 quite, hy we're quite hyped up. It's, it's, I remember throughout the whole experience, it was fun. Like I, I, well, of course, there's nervousness going on because you have to be on stage and you're addressing like wide, you get so many participants down there, right? But it's really fun in general because you get to really challenge yourself and you get to see these people, your peers around you, and you guys, you know that, hey, I'm not alone. We're all doing this together and we're all um, trying to advance ourselves in research, trying to share what we're passionate about. So I would encourage you guys, um, if you guys have time and if you guys feel like there's a research you have in mind um, that you've done that you want to present. Go for a Grass Slam presentation. Um, it is a really good opportunity to meet new friends. And it's a great opportunity to tell people about what you'd love to do. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Sean. It was it was like reliving that experience. It was great. Uh, speaking of, I did. Uh, we also went on a hike later. It was really fun. I should do that again. <laughs> um, Thank you so much for that. And now let's just transition to um, our panel. So like I mentioned earlier, we have a, a diversity of representation here from people from different uh, programs. And we have a staff member, Melody, who's actually uh, from my program. She's here too. So I'm going to go ahead and request the panelists to go ahead and go in introduce themselves. Um, yeah, so Pranav, if you want to uh, get us started, please. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. I am Pranav Gangwar. I'm a I'm a third year PhD student in the EC department and my specialization is computer engineering and currently I'm doing research in bioinformatics. Uh, so that's pretty much about me. Um, hi everyone, I'm Sudhan Shushankar and I'm a second year master's student in MAE and my research is on multi-agent robotics. Hi guys, um, I'm Sean again. Uh, uh, just want to highlight another perk of Grasslam is you get these really cool headshots. I get I got this headshot from Grasslam, so you know it's another perk. And yeah, I'm from cognitive science program, and I do neurolinguistics research. Hi everyone, my name is Melody Baziar Catalano. I am the manager of graduate and student instructional services in the School of Biological Sciences. I also completed my EDD at UCSD last year. So um, my research is on underrepresented minority students in graduate education. All right, next slide, please. So they, the way, just a reminder, uh, just to reiterate, um, there's some general questions that are designed intentionally to be broad strokes, because just to reiterate, uh, research would look very different based on which program you're in, and in some in courses it could be optional. Uh, this is something you reach out to uh, and to initiate that process. So this is going to be a 
um, a lot of questions about that. So please feel free to use the the, uh, the Q and A feature. And we just have some general questions here to kind of get a, a broader perspective uh, from different people. So let's just start off with like a general, how does research work in your program question? And uh, so to get a sense of just how that works basically. So anyone panelists, if you wanna uh, chime in. Uh, I can start with, uh, uh, by describing about how it works in the EC department. Uh, so in the uh, in the master's program of the EC department, uh, you are not uh, like it's it's uh, there is taking research is not compulsory. You can have a thesis track or a non thesis track. So, uh, but I have seen people who are who have chosen the non thesis track still engage in research. So the only difference would be they won't be writing a thesis, but they can still do research, sharpen their skills. Uh, so it's basically uh, your choice at the end of the day, whether you want to do a thesis or not. And uh, at the same time, there are a lot of opportunities uh, in the EC department, in the computer science department that I know of that uh, you can have a look at and engage in the research. Yeah, like pretty same with the MA department too. And uh, like you have thesis and non-thesis and uh, in MA specifically, you can switch between the two, like back and forth a lot of times. So uh, at the end only like you finalize if you're doing a thesis or not, or else you can just keep like doing your coursework too for the coursework requirement and then graduate itself. And um, uh, in research, you can either like do a thesis with your advisor or you can do like research with professors of any department, let's say. And I've seen people with collaborating with like uh, pro, like professors of different departments and like in their labs and doing research. Also in EC, I guess there's also one program as SRIP, uh, where you get like funded research for the summer. So that's one added program in EC, but yeah, I think that's only in EC. Um, so, uh, for me, I think in my program, uh, research is, so we have a second year and a third year project, which you, um, kind of have to come up with your study and you kind of carry it out throughout a year. So you have enough time and en enough resources for, to support you to do that. And I'd say in my program, we really, um, we really value the collaborative experience. So you will get to meet professors, not only from your lab, but also from some other labs. So we have lab rotations in the first year. You'll get to see what the world in your department is like, not only just your lab. Um, and that experience kind of just broadens your horizon and you'll be able to know what your niche is in the future. And it kind of just builds up to what you want to finally do for your PhD thesis. And I would also say that not only uh, my, my program, I think UCSD um, also has that collaborative and you know this the sharing vibe all going around um i would say if you want to reach out to a professor at a different program and say hey can i audit one of your classes or can i do something with you i believe they will they will, of course they will think um they will uh, they'll think well uh, let's see if we can do this but I, I i don't think they'll say just like no no i'm not gonna do this with you yeah uh so that's that's basically my experience um i think the structure is pretty well in my program and it just, we have the resources we need and the people we want to reach out to will always give us a response. Um, from an administration standpoint, so um, the PhD in biological sciences is a rotation-based first year for students um, to give students the opportunity to identify their labs. I think some of the other large STEM programs on campus function similarly, obviously, with their own variations of that. Um, I want to second the collaboration. Um, UC San Diego's strength is its collaborations across um, campus and across departments, um, even across the street at School of Medicine. So please lean on that. And if you um, are doing a thesis track, whether you're a master's or a PhD student, you will have to assemble a committee. And um, one of those members has to be from someone outside of your home department. And that is also to help engage people um, in a collaborative spirit and folks across campus that can help you build skills that you might not have or um, might be a mentor in an identity group that you um, identify with. So there's a lot of different ways to build your committee um, to be successful at UC San Diego. And Sai, you might be able to say more uh, from the student perspective. 
Yeah, I was just gonna jump in. Uh, Melody covered most of it. Uh, yeah, I was just we do rotation in first year. We can do up to six, um, minimum of four. I was describing it to somebody yesterday. It's like speed dating for scientists. <laughs> you you the whole first year you um, just work in different labs. Uh, I chose to work in all neuroscience labs, and the collaboration part of it, I can uh, speak to that because uh, I'm my labs at the Salk Institute, so you could choose uh, from all the labs. At UCSD, plus you have Sanford and you have La Jolla Institute of Immunology and you have Sanford Burnham. So there's there's a lot of opportunities and pretty much and Salk is also a great place where um, you can reach out to people who are not necessarily from your program or don't necessarily study the exact thing you thought uh, when you set out uh, for grad school that you would study. So there's like a lot of crosstalk um, and that's one of the things I really like too. So yeah, uh, I can definitely vouch for that too. So if you could just go ahead to the next slide, please. All right, my favorite question. <laughs> what are some, uh, if people can talk about uh, students from the mistakes that you may have committed or senior peers commit, or uh, Melody, from your perspective on the admin side, what are some mistakes? Because I'm sure I've done a bunch too, uh, part of the process. But yeah, let's, let's hear some anecdotes. Uh, I can go first. Uh, so I would say, I wouldn't say this is kind of a mistake, but it's kind of like a meta analysis, so like a like a re, uh, re, uh, let's say let's say a look back of what 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 we did, what I did. Uh, I would say like when I was looking for opportunities, there's a lot of exploring, and I started out being like fearful um to step to step into any field. Like I rotated with the lab that does um large language models, and I knew nothing about that before hopping into that, and I was really wary, and I was really I'm kind of afraid in the beginning, uh, but then it turns out um, I realized that, hey, I, I learned a lot throughout the quarter and I knew that this might not be what exactly I would do in the future. Like that, that is, that is basically um, an opportunity to tell you that you can kind of, you can go through this process of elimination and you can find what you really want to do. So I would say um, it would, it's not really a mistake, but it's just, you can treat every mistake as a beautiful experience and make it your own process of elimination to finding your 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 future niche so um yeah the common mistake is there might be a lot of mistakes but just they're all not mistakes i would say okay. uh, i'd like mm. to jump in uh yeah yeah so uh the one mistake i did was uh i started by, uh, my research journey by associating myself with one lab and uh, even though the th things were not working out fine with me, I still didn't uh, jump to a different lab uh, as uh, early as I would have liked to. I was just still trying out different things in the same lab. Same lab. Uh, I learned about a lot of things. As Sean just said, uh, you always uh, learn, uh, even with your bad experiences. But in hindsight, I uh, I would have, if, if given another chance, I would have jumped, changed my lab much sooner. Um, and so currently I am working in a completely different field than what I had imagined two years back. Uh, so that is my journey. And as uh, everyone has already mentioned, UC San Diego fosters the collaborative nature and you can find opportunities everywhere, whatever you like to do. Uh, there is always someone working in that field. So you can take their courses, uh, talk to them, uh, see how you fit in the research and then make your own space. Uh, yeah, like uh, one of the common mistakes I've seen or maybe like uh, people can improve upon, like speaking of masters, is uh, like if you're not in the courses of any of the prof you want to work with, uh, the only thing you have is email, right? So you'll be shooting out emails to them. And these emails could be like really long. And I feel like what I feedback I got from the professors is like, you should keep it short. Uh, like like to the point and it's only happens when you like read out their research right and also um, one more thing is uh, like you send out an email and then you just send out like one follow up and then you're like oh he's not replying or she's not replying but um, what i found is like uh, some professors uh, are like really busy and they just don't have the time to reply to you so you can go like as long as like 10 12, 12 follow ups but they'll reply, they'll reply once. They'll reply like there's no space in the lab or maybe they'll reply something, right? And 
they won't reply like uh, frustrated for like the number of follow-ups you gave because i've seen people like give a, like insane amount of follow-ups but still the professors are very good with that so you should not be afraid of like shooting out like insane amount of follow-ups if you're like really interested in the professor so yeah you can just go go on with like lots of follow-ups i think that's cool so one more point to add what sudanshu just mentioned so yes you sh- professors are definitely busy and uh, if you are not getting responses after a couple of mails you can probably reach out to their phd students they'll have a better idea why the professor is not responding so you can always uh, try that thing out as well um from the staff standpoint i think and i don't i don't necessarily think they're mistakes i think every um thing is a learning like you all said a learning opportunity um is waiting waiting too long or not doing your research. So, um, you know, anybody can feel that like, hey, this person actually doesn't know what I do. And they're just kind of reaching out to me because their rotation starts next week and they weren't able to find another place. So, you know, make sure you're letting people know why you're interested in doing rotations or why you're interested in their research. I think that goes a long way. Um, So doing your homework, I think is really valuable and um, makes you a memorable person because you're probably not the only student on campus reaching out to that person. Um, also, most ki- most faculty are available in their labs or on campus, so you could stop by. Um, meeting with faculty is also a really good opportunity. And also, um, one thing I see when students first enter programs, and I've been working with graduate students in all kinds of programs for a very long time, um, is kind of being very specific. Like, I only want to do this one thing. And sometimes it's hard to recognize when you're in it that there's other ways that you can do that same thing with different people. So just keeping an open mind and starting early. Yeah, I just want to echo what everyone said about the emails. They do uh, get very busy. They get just barrel of emails every day so if someone doesn't uh respond please follow up uh, might go on a limb and say 12 is too many Sudanshu. <laughs> but i guess it just depends on <laughs> the the program uh but i i did mean to add that uh, sh- keeping them short and simple uh, basically but to write a short email in which you want to co- uh, convey all that you have to do your homework to even write that small email because professors know they can kind of sniff out the genuine uh interest versus like melody said oh i'm just on a deadline i just need to reach out to whoever that kind of thing uh sometimes cold emails do work out too so it's really there's no uh one way to do it but uh yeah just don't put all your eggs in one basket basically uh, can we just go to the next slide, please? Yes. Um, another one, I just want to quickly say, this is, again, something that would depend on the program. Um, so yeah, let's just hear other people's perspectives on how it works um, with everyone else's programs here. Um, I can go for... Uh, yeah, please. Okay, so like you can start approaching faculty um, like, like now itself or... Uh, like at the start of the program or after like like anywhere you feel like you want to start working so it's not like you have to start like start applying or start approaching only at the start of the quarter you can also start mid quarter and um, because it mostly like for masters mostly mostly would be like an informal uh, setting with the professor for like having them to having you to be in the lab and just explore some research opportunity, opportunities for the first few weeks let's say so you can like mail any time and a good time is like if you already met the professor in person in your courses so after that you can like there's a very good time and very good time for the like to make yourself noticeable to the professor so that he replies uh yeah uh i would say from my experience because uh, I had to reach what before even apply well, when I was applying to my program, I reached out to one professor that I really wanted to work with. And and so it all started really early on. And when I got got in here, um, one of my rotations was also with my the PI that I reached out to. So it, everything just kind of flowed um, in the same line as in how it started. Uh, so for me, it was just ever since. Uh, so I started approaching them even right, right before I applied for the program. But I think uh, I think 
to start approaching faculty, the best, I think for me, the best answer is just now. Like whenever you feel like there's a need to do something, you're like, oh, wait, I should do it. Then just go for it because you, you might just get some new opportunities you don't, even, you don't even know of and and start reaching out, start getting close to them, taking their classes, auditing, uh, even being research assistants or, or just sitting in a lab meetings. Right? These will get you opportunities to to probably move forward in your research or collaboration opportunities. So yeah, now. <laughs> so I would also like to say the same thing. There's no better time like the present uh, because uh, as you are just joining uh, UC San Diego, uh, every professor, uh, like or, or I should say most of the professors, they have limited uh, resources, limited time to mentor students. So uh, if if you get too late, uh, you might miss out on the opportunity because the professor might already have taken the students that they want in their labs. Uh, and at the same time, you cannot uh, just uh, randomly approach some professor uh, who is working in a field about which you have no idea. So you have to find the right fit. And for that, again, you have to go through their profiles, what research is they are doing. And once, you, uh, uh, once uh, the professor agrees to taking you in, you don't have to start doing research on from day one itself. Uh, you need some time to ramp up, obviously. So while you are taking the courses in the first quarter, uh, you can take that time to understand uh, about the problem that they're trying to solve and basically do the ramp up. And from next quarter onwards, you can seriously start doing the research. So again, yeah, this is the best time. I'm going to echo all of that. Um... Start early, start often, um, reach out. It's the internet is great. When I was um, a grad student the first time, there wasn't all these lab websites and everything available. So you can do this while you're cooking dinner, you know, or you have something in the oven or your favorite show is about to start. So just think about it as early as possible. Can we go to the next slide, please? Right, who wants to chime in? I can get, uh, get it started. Uh, I have, um, so I have had a master's degree uh, before I was here, I was in Wisconsin, uh, very different places wise, yes, sure, but also the research was different. I, I would say, uh, I don't know if it resonates with other people on the panel, but I think when you come to grad school, um, you're all bright eyed and bushy tail and you know exactly what you want to study. And then you're like, this is my passion and stuff like that, which is great. But also please keep yourself open to other opportunities because there's a lot of people in my program who came in one sure to like do one thing and they just fell in love with something else and so just keep that option open a little bit um so and i think ucsd is different in the sense that you have plenty of opportunity to do that uh so that's not necessarily an adjustment so like a, also welcome uh change in that sense um yeah if if any panelists have anything so please weigh in on that any advice uh, uh so yeah, I can go and there, there's this uh, uh, like a lot of us are from semester systems, right? And like UCSD is quarter system. So it gets very fast, uh, like as as a master student at least, it like, it's like it gets very fast uh, the quarter. And usually master student would be doing like the research with like having already having three courses or maybe two courses and research credits. So it gets really fast paced, uh, especially in UC San Diego. And uh, still you'll be having weekly meetings, like mostly you'll be having weekly meetings with your advisor about your progress. And so I'll say that could get really uh, stressful sometimes. And then you have to like do a lot of time management in order to be up with the pace. So I think that's something uh, that could be different from other institutions because a lot of master's programs are also semester systems, right? So that could be a, a big difference. And also uh, in UCSD, I've seen like there are a lot of seminars happening and you can meet a lot of PhDs in all these seminars, right? So I advise like people to attend these seminars and like it opens your scope a lot. And like, I think I've seen like this is in the culture, so, like everyone goes to these seminars and they just enjoy 
B7 has a lot, so I think that's different in UCSD. Can we go to the next slide, please? We covered it a little bit, um, but if anything else that we may have glossed over, if anyone wants to chime in about how to decide on your research. My only piece of advice would be, if you're not sure, um, when you email professors, uh, you don't have to have, you don't have to be committal completely. It's just keep it a little vague uh, in the sense that you just don't have to say that, oh, I only want to work with you, that kind of thing. You can just set up a meeting and talk about it. Or most professors uh, are okay if you want to just go attend a lab meeting. I think that's a great place to uh, kind of get a sense for not just what they do, but also how is it week to week? Because they're likely not doing polished presentations in lab meetings, which is raw data. And then you just stick talking about, you kind of see that aspect and you can learn a lot about uh, a lab from just their routine meetings. And some professors are okay with you sitting in on them and you can make your decision based on that. Uh, if you're on the fence about um, between labs or something like that, go attend the meetings and get a feel for it. And sometimes it boils down to the culture and lab and people and does not even the research interests. Uh, so yeah, you'd be surprised how many times, uh, yeah, you, I think I've been told a lot of times and I would say the same thing again, you pick the advisor, uh, not the project necessarily and everything works out. So that's my piece of advice. Uh, does anyone have anything else? Um, once again, coming from many, many, many years of working with students and being a student myself, um, I know this maybe wasn't the intention of the question, but I think the best place to start is with yourself and really decide what's important to you, what your goals are short-term and long-term, um, what your life looks like and what you want out of um, both an advisor and your research program. Um, the same for masters, same for PhD students. Um, I think always starting with yourself and checking in with yourself too is gonna be, um, a really important tool for success throughout your academic journey. So uh, I would like to again emphasize more on the seminars part, like what I mentioned last time. So uh, like uh, I would like uh, got a new trick uh, recently where where you can uh, re like you can register like on on web uh, like webbridge on like different course uh, courses for like seminars right for different departments so you'll get the email prompts from these departments too because in ma like you get i get only emails from ma right so it, but the cse and ac department are also having a lot of seminars which like because most of research is interdisciplinary so you get to experience uh, from like these departments too from not your departments so you can register on them and you can get the emails for these seminars and like try to attend as many seminars as you can so that 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 like opens up your scope a lot and um, like you you'll meet a lot of phd students also working in your area so you can talk to them and you can also meet a lot of phd students in ispo events too so just attend ispo events <laughs> yeah and like talking to phds uh, clears out the like scope of professor a lot because the things you see on website could could lead you in a different way but when you talk to them you like you, you get to know actually what the professor does right so i think talking to phds and like attending seminars would be a great start to like finalize where you want to work with i would just like to extend on so that what sudanshu just said so i know about the csc department so uh, the csc department has a csc 290 series so there it's like a uh, one credit or two credit uh, seminar thing. So based, uh, if you go to the webridge, if you will see that there are lots of professors, they have their own course. So you can just read about them. So I know about my field. So every quarter there is something called computer architecture lunch. So there people just go and uh, present the latest research happening in the community. And similar to that, there are a lot of seminars for different subfields in computer science. So you can just attend them, see where our interest lies. And similarly, EC department also has something. I just am not aware of the exact course number. So you can just take a look at different departments, uh, go on WebRidge and just register for them, attend them. And in some of the seminars, you even get free food.
We do not have a whole lot of time, so I just want to uh, mention that we only have a couple more questions left. But meanwhile, please uh, use the Q&A feature to, if you're asking, if you have any burning questions, please ask them now. Um, and I also want to quickly add that um, if this is really nice people on campus. They, if, almost you can reach out to anyone and meet for coffee. Uh, and most people will um, say yes, and you can just meet with them. So it's low key and no pressure. You can just start from there. It's a great place to start. And also uh, I think one of the panelists brought up, just, just email program coordinators and ask them to put you on their email list. Um, so I'm in the bio program, but I'm in a neuroscience lab and there's also a neuro PhD program. So a lot of my interests do also align with that program. So you just reach out to them and you also start getting their uh, seminars and departmental event emails. And a lot of which are open to like general public and you can just go uh, by general public. I mean, the whole, whole grad, anyone can, any other grad student can go, um, that kind of stuff. So that's another thing I wanted to add. Uh, with only a few minutes left, uh, the next few questions were about uh, work-life balance and uh, is there any specific advice to international students when it comes to research? Um, and the final one is how do you define a successful student? So if panelists have uh, any thoughts on any of these questions or is there any question we should have asked or if anything missed, so this is now the time to, it's completely open to the floor. So just please take it away and please finish us off, yeah. Cool. Let me quickly uh, address the question asked. Uh, so do you reach out to professor in advance before registering for the research course? Uh, in, in my program, we we have like a lab, we have, we have lab rotations, we have individual research credits. And for those, you do need to reach out to the PI. And so you do need to reach out either your PI or some other um, researcher you tend uh, you tend to rotate or work work with. So yes, um, but if it's it's a seminar course, I would say it's still good for you to write um, to ask about like the syllabus so that you can prepare beforehand so you could sit in um, knowing that okay yeah this is something I'm interested in I'll be able to sit in for the rest of the quarter. So yeah, I would say anyways no matter what it's good to reach out first. Just depends on whether you are. Um, if you want to work on a project with this professor, you better be more committed. You better be more prepared. Yes. And so another thing I think I would encourage international students to do is um, try to search for scholarships or grants, right? I mean, it makes your life better. It makes your life easier. Uh, uh, either, either you have scholarships from your hometown um, or you have scholarships from from different places. Try to go for those. Because I know um, for international, international students, it kind of closes up some opportunities like the NSF and the NI, NIH, am I right? Um, yeah, the, these 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 um, fellowships we aren't able to apply for. So we have to look extra hard for things. But I would say start early, search for those, um, hunt those. And and sometimes it will make your research easier. It will sometimes you get you get um, some, some stipended for your life. It makes your life easier. So yeah, go for those. Yeah, like, Pointing the question in the chat, like if it's for the research credits in masters, um, so I think you'll first need to get a confirmation from the professor, like you you can enroll in the research credits, and after then like they'll 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 themselves ask you to apply for research credits, um, and you can register them like even after starting the quarter, so that's fine. There's not not any hurry with registering these four credits, so you could. And uh, yeah, uh, one more point uh, uh, was like, like though, uh, like if you are, if you want to take a course which not a lot of people are taking, I think that's better. Like if you're interested in such a course, because then you find like a very small group of people in the course, right? Like eight to ten people, and then you can have a very good interaction with the professor, and it's also a good chance to land in their lab. So. Like, just don't take the courses because everyone is taking and don't take courses if you already know the stuff. Try to take new courses and like, uh, or aim, like you can filter courses also with if they have like course projects at the end. And uh, so that's also a good way to like experience how is it working with the professor. And you can get to know all of these, like what all in the, is in the courses, like either from the website, WebBridge itself, or maybe there's like websites for the courses, like last fall, last quarter, last year. So you can just refer them and just uh, know which courses have projects and just you can take them. 
just just uh, oh i'm so sorry. sorry go ahead yes go ahead okay just be on the lookout uh, for the special courses as sudhanshu said so because they are offered like once every year or once every two years and so uh, most, most probably if it is a special course the number of people taking that course will be less and most probably it will also be a research oriented course where you will be uh, the professor will be to- uh, talking about the latest research so that's also a good way to start with that uh, let's wrap up um I just want to begin by thanking all the the panelists and the presenters tim sarah sudanshu pranav shan malady thank you so much uh, for taking the time out of your goodness of your heart to volunteer your time for this it was a great discussion thank you um in the end i just want to highlight a couple of um ispo uh, highlights basically so meetups ispo meetups are a great way for the international students here uh to meet like-minded people uh, we offer uh, different kinds of meetups one is like interest based and regional so to register for them uh, head to iorientation uh, ucsd.com/meetup uh, next slide please um there's a lot of events happening constantly if you could actually go to next slide as well um coffee hours this week some of you have seen there uh, every day of this week uh we have coffee hours just come say hello talk to other incoming students and we do have coffee hours um throughout the year as well so great place to find uh friends or a collaborator next slide please um so, uh, these are some of the events you might recognize i saw you some of uh, you at the mixer last night there's uh, other mixers coming up a lot of social events now especially during the orientation and throughout the rest of year so please keep your eyes peeled and speaking of also please bookmark the i events calendar great place to find what's happening uh, on campus now and the rest of the year so please have that bookmarked on your browser so you can refer to it uh, time to time next slide please and finally uh so just log into instagram please follow ispo and we have a giveaway so tag us um and if you have a picture from one of the events here you've attended uh in the last day or two or end the rest of this week please do so you get a chance to um uh, win cool stuff and with that please take a moment to fill out the survey by scanning the qr code we really appreciate uh, everyone who could make it and as always you know how to reach us please don't hesitate to reach out with any questions comments suggestions and with that thank you so much and have a good rest of your day bye thank you everyone bye thank you.